Hey guys, welcome back to Bob Mupchem. In this video, we're going to be looking at intermolecular forces. So before we look at metallic and ionic bonding, we're going to be looking at the non-chemical forces that attract different covalent compounds together. But first, here's a question. Using VSEPR theory, deduce the shape of H3O+. Draw the Lewis structure, name it, and give the bond angle. So with H3O+, of course, we're going to have four electron domains, but with three bonding pairs. So we have a tetrahedral base structure with one lone pair. That gives us a trigonal pyramidal shape. And because of that shape with the lone pair, we would usually have a 109.5 degree angle, but we're going to reduce that by 2 degrees to give us 107.5 degrees as the bond angle. Turning our attention to intermolecular forces, first giving a general definition. So these are the attractive forces that act between these simple covalent molecules. And these are partially broken when we go from solid to liquid and they are fully broken when we go from liquid to gas. And that's important to remember that when we go through these state changes, we're not actually breaking the compounds down, we're just breaking these intermolecular forces. And here on the graph on the right, you can see there is evidence for these as we increase the temperature of a substance, as we add energy, we see that we hit a point at the melting and boiling point where the substance keeps absorbing energy but does not increase in temperature and that is evidence of the energy required to overcome the attractive intermolecular forces between the molecules. Okay so not all intermolecular forces are created equally so the term van der Waals forces is a term that refers as a catch-all to three types of intermolecular forces. Firstly, we have London forces, which are also called dispersion forces or induced dipole forces. Next, we have Debye forces, which are also called permanent to induced dipole forces. Now, we won't actually study these at IB, I'm just including them here for completeness. Lastly, we have Keesum forces, which are also called dipole-dipole forces. And it's important to remember that online van der Waals forces are sometimes used as a description as just London forces, all forces, or just some intermolecular forces. So just check your sources as you're doing your further research. So let's start by having a look at London forces. So London forces are caused when random electron movements create a small and temporary dipole in the molecule. And this is why they're sometimes called temporary or temporary induced dipole forces. And this is also to do with the fact that once this happens in a molecule, the molecule next to it is going to be affected by the charge separation of its adjacent molecule and that's going to cause a further dipole in the molecule next to it. And when we have the opposite charges, those charges form an attractive force between the two molecules. So we can illustrate this by visualizing the electron clouds of these two atoms. And if we have more electrons to one side, we have a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge. That induces the same charge separation in the molecule next to it. And so we have an attractive force between them. Now, because this is instantaneous, it happens and changes very often, this creates quite a small attraction, and this is why this is the weakest of all of our intermolecular forces. That does also mean, though, it is the most prevalent. And even in molecules with other intermolecular forces, London forces will always be present. Anytime there is electrons present, there is a possibility of that random charge separation occurring. That doesn't mean they're the same size in all molecules and their magnitude is affected by two factors. Those factors are the molecular mass of the 
element or molecule and that's obviously due to the fact there'll be more electrons when there's a higher molecular mass and the other is the surface area of the molecule because that will be the effective surface over which these forces can act looking at each of these factors in more depth before we move on to the other forces let's look at how surface area can affect these forces so the shapes of molecules play a large role in the relative strength of these London forces and the main factor behind that is distance distance reduces bond strength so the closer molecules can get to each other the larger the magnitude of these London forces let's illustrate this with C4H10 so we can draw this in two different ways firstly in the straight chain hydrocarbon butane and also in the branch chain hydrocarbon 2 methyl propane both of these have exactly the same molecular mass but if we look at the boiling point butane is zero, minus 0 0.5 degrees and 2 methyl propane is minus 11.7 so very simply, we can visualize the butane as one single line that is easily able to line up with other molecules next to it, allowing it to form many London forces. Whereas this T-shaped methyl propane finds it much more difficult to form those bonds because there's less places for that attraction to happen. And because there's less London forces and less attraction, that means there's less to be overcome to boil the molecule and so the boiling point is lower. When we think about the effect of molecular mass on these forces, we just have to invoke the definition of the induced dipole force. It's caused by random movement of electrons. A larger molecular mass means more electrons and more electrons means larger forces of attraction. Visualizing this we just have to draw simple atoms or molecules and we can see that when we've got a larger cloud of electrons and we have that random chance separation on either side there are just more electrons involved in that chance separation and that means the chance separation can induce a larger chance separation in the molecule next to it and thus have a larger attractive force. Now we can evidence this really easily in the noble gases. The noble gases are very simple, they exist just as individual atoms and as we go down the periodic table we increase the number of electrons and we can also see the boiling point gradually increase as we go down the group. This gives us a nice simple illustration of this effect especially as these are such simple gases. Okay. Let's have a couple of questions on the whiteboards just to check in. First question, nice and simple, how are London forces formed? Pause the video and have a go at that. Pop them up! And hopefully we remembered that of course we need a chance separation of electrons which causes an induced dipole. Next question, what two factors affect the magnitude of dispersion forces. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up! Of course the two factors are molecular mass or specifically the number of electrons and the surface area of the molecule. To further understand the other types of intermolecular force we need to understand how polar molecules are formed and to do that we need to look at how polar bonds and symmetry interact. So we already know that the difference in electronegativity can cause polar bonds. That's where the electrons move towards one of the atoms in a covalent bond more than the other. These bonds have a polar moment. However, just because there is a polar moment doesn't mean that the overall molecule will be polar. For that, we need the molecule to be asymmetrical so that the molecule can have an overall polar moment. So here, water we can see has an overall polar moment. However, there is no net dipole in CO2 because the polar bonds are in equal and opposite directions 
so they cancel each other out. So this allows us to conceptualize the other type of intermolecular force we're going to look at, which is Kiesen forces. So these are sometimes called dipole-dipole or permanent dipole-dipole forces. If the molecule has a net dipole, and that gives it this permanent state in which we can always predict where there would be more or less electrons, then the separation between the charges is no longer random. Um, it's no longer up to chance. And because of that permanence, it means that the molecules arrange themselves more systematically to attract each other. If we look here, if we have a permanent situation where the electrons are more concentrated on the right side of these molecules, then we're going to have a predictable attraction between the molecules, which is going to be much stronger than that of London forces. And because of that, it's going to require more energy to break these molecules apart and therefore it gives us a higher boiling point than we would expect if we just had London forces. Okay, a couple of questions just to consolidate. First question, which is stronger, Kiesem or London forces? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up! Of course, Kiesem forces are permanent and London are temporary induced dipole. So Kiesem forces are stronger. Next question, why when some molecules have polar bonds, are they not polar molecules? Pause the video to have a go at that one. Pop them up. Well, in this case, we have to consider that these molecules are probably symmetrical, just like this tetrahedral tetrachloromethane in which all of the chlorine carbon bonds are polar but they all pull in equal and opposite directions and so therefore is not a polar molecule. Last question for now, based on what we've done, what type of intermolecular forces would we expect in HBr? Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So drawing out the Lewis structure of HBr, we obviously see bromine much more electronegative. So we would expect electrons to be much more pulled over towards the bromine atom, causing a permanent dipole. And of course, if we have a permanent dipole, we have a Kiesem force or a dipole-dipole force. So now I want to take some time to look at the boiling points of the hydrides. So if we look at the group four hydrides, we see a general increase in the boiling point as we go down the group, which is what we might expect because we're gonna have an increase in molecular mass. With an increased molecular mass, we're increasing the number of electrons and thus increasing the attractive force of the London forces. So far, so good, going with what we've already done. However, when we look at the group five hydrides, we see this anomaly, which is NH3. Initially, we might think, well, that's maybe because the NH bond is polar, but also the phosphorus hydrogen bond is polar, and we still see a big drop in the boiling point for pH3. pH3 should have a higher boiling point because more London forces. So something's not quite right here. And we actually see the same trend for the group six hydrides. Water having a much higher boiling point than we would expect, especially as both sulfur and oxygen bonds to hydrogen are polar. And H2O should therefore have a lower boiling point than that of SH2. And lo and behold, when we look at the group seven hydrides, we once again see that these period two hydrides of nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine have a much higher boiling point than we would expect them to have if we only had dipole-dipole forces and London forces holding these together. So this is evidence of a new type of intermolecular force that we haven't covered so far. And this force is called hydrogen bonding. 
This is the strongest type of intermolecular force and only occurs in molecules that have a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine atom. And that's because they're the most electronegative elements, which means that it's very easy when they're covalently bonded to hydrogen for the electrons to shift towards those atoms, causing a very strong polarity across that bond. So what then happens is the lone pair on these electronegative atoms is then attracted to the very electron deficient hydrogen atoms on the adjacent molecules and thus causing a very strong attractive force. For example, in hydrogen fluoride, we see the fluorine atom being attracted to the partially positive hydrogen on the adjacent molecules. Now, this is effectively a type of Keesum force, okay? The only real difference with hydrogen bonding is these are orders of magnitude stronger and require orders of magnitude more energy to break. So we make them their own separate category, even though really by definition, they're still the dipole-dipole forces we looked at previously. But we have to separate out nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine as these particular special cases because of how strong these bonds are. Molecules that contain these types of bonds usually have pretty interesting properties. So water, for example, when it organizes itself uh, in the solid state, when it's ice, the intermolecular forces, these hydrogen bonds that form, end up being somewhat reminiscent of a tetrahedral structure that we might expect from diamond, for example. And this is obviously very strong and makes ice very uh, strong indeed. It also increases the volume of ice, and that is one of the uh, special features of water that the solid actually floats on top of the liquid, which is a key component of its biological significance and allows you know, life to exist in the oceans and uh, fresh water. And its density is actually highest at four degrees. So let's just summarize our intermolecular forces then. We have London forces, which is where we have two non-polar molecules interacting with each other due to a chance separation in electrons. We have Debye forces, which is non-polar with polar, which we haven't actually looked at and you don't need for IB. We have Keesum forces, which is two polar molecules attracting each other with a permanent dipole. And we have a very important subset of these. When we have fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen bonding to hydrogen, we form hydrogen bonds. So here's some data and some questions where you can kind of use your understanding to apply in a slightly longer format. So pause the video and have a go at these questions. I'll go through the answers in a moment. So for each of these, you need to consider the Lewis structure. For the first one, we have hydrogen bondings in the hydrogen fluoride and just dipole dipole in the hydrogen chloride, which explains why hydrogen fluoride is much higher. Now we have to consider the symmetry in both of number two, that's H2O and H2. 2s. They have hydrogen bonds and dipole-dipole respectively. And lastly, we have NH3 and PH3. We of course have hydrogen bonds in NH3 and just dipole-dipole in PH3, explaining the difference there as well. Okay guys, so of course, questions to be completing on this. Thanks again for joining me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and as always, Practice makes slightly better.